Hi, I'm Ryan Eustace, Senior Vice President of Automated Driving at Toyota Research Institute. Thank you for the opportunity to give you the keynote today and to share with you our perspective on the road to vehicle automation. So the outline of my talk, first I'll tell you a little bit about TRI, tell you about our perspective on what we think the current state is of automated driving, TRI's approach in terms of our chauffeur and guardian applications, some examples of the core automated driving capabilities that are shared between those two different applications, and then end on what is our guardian first strategy. So a few facts about TRI. We were launched in January 2016. We're based here in North America with three offices. Our headquarters are in California. We have offices in Ann Arbor, Michigan and Cambridge, Mass. We're about 300 people and we work across the spectrum of automated driving, mobile robotics in the home, and also our exploratory research where we use AI to say, develop and help us uh, find new battery chemistries to improve batteries for EVs. So let me tell you a little bit about TRI's testing pyramid when it comes to automated driving. I like to think of testing for automated vehicles as a pyramid. We're at the base, we have what we refer to as virtual testing, followed by then closed course and public road testing. Every time we update our code, the entire system is first run through simulation and a series of tests at an engineer's desk and in the cloud, emulating how a car will respond on the road to ensure that nothing's regressed in the code change. Once everything operates correctly, we test on closed course and then ultimately public roads. We conduct our closed course tests at our proprietary facility in Michigan, where we have agreements with M-City and ACM in Michigan, as well as GoMentum Station in California, where we do the additional testing. Public road testing then is there to test our assumptions and to find the unknown unknowns. It's a rich source of data that we use then to incorporate back into our foundation of simulation test cases. So when it comes to simulation, there's basically three kind of main ways that we use for approaching it. There's what we refer to as planner control testing. So this is where we can do um, skip or bypass all of this kind of sensing sim, but really focus on scenarios and kind of complex uh, agent interaction between our vehicle and other vehicles. We have sensor sim, which is basically, you can think of it as like driving in the matrix. This is where we have a virtual world. We simulate the sensor inputs and our software our stack doesn't know the difference. And it gives us basically a full system shakedown of, of our autonomy system. And then finally, we have what we call log replay. This is derived from real data, basically data logs that we collect both from automated driving and a manual data collects. We're able to reprocess that data using hardware in the loop so that we can emulate the full uh, hardware configuration of the vehicle. And this allows us to do both uh, open loop and closed loop kind of log replay to understand, uh, again, both the perception and prediction kind of interactions. Now, we have an evolution of test platforms uh, that we've uh, built uh, here at TRI. When TRI was created in January of 2016, we inherited the existing efforts that Toyota had in automated driving. So both the team and their original vehicles became part of TRI when we launched. Uh, we quickly began by making copies of that initial vehicle and then expanded out very rapidly to building a series of vehicles from our platform two to three to our current generation vehicles, the platform fours, which you can see have a much more kind of clean integrated look of the, uh, of the perception sensors with the vehicle. Now let me tell you a little bit of our perspective on the current state of automated driving. And I'd like to start off with this quote called Amara's Law. We tend to overestimate the effect of technology in the short run and underestimate the effect in the long run. And you can think about this as feeding into what's called the hype cycle, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Now uh, from Ed Olson, CEO of Bain Mobility, again, going back to about February 2019 with a, a, a Medium article that he posted, where he basically talked about Moore's Law for self-driving. So for those of you, um, you may have heard about Moore's Law before, but, but it's basically it's this idea in the computer industry that the number of transistors on the chip doubles about every 18 months. What Ed did was to try to extrapolate the same sort of analogy to self-driving. To do that, what he did is he went back in time to kind of looking in 2004 with the early DARPA challenges, what's the furthest distance that some of those vehicles could drive at the time? And that was about 10 kilometers or so. Um, next, uh, he uh, looked at the more public data from Waymo back in 2018, where they reported something on the order of uh, 11,000 miles per disengagement. Now, by extrapolating between those things, what Ed came up with is that basically there's a kind of a, this doubling rate in terms of miles per disengagement that looks, works out to be something about every 16 months. Now, if we take that very optimistic view that in the self-driving industry we're gonna double our performance in terms of miles per disengagement every 16 months. What you find though, is that it still is going to take us, at, even at that 16, 
16 month rate, it's still gonna take us over 16 years to get at human levels of performance, which pushes us out to 2035. Now, what do we mean by that? Well, today, human drivers in aggregate across the US, we talk about one fatality per 100 million miles driven. And getting to that standard, you can see that the self-driving industry is really nowhere near close to achieving those levels of performance. Moreover, what makes this even a harder goal to reach is that uh, one fatality per 100 million miles, that actually includes drunk and distracted drivers. If we eliminate that category and just talk about alert, attentive human drivers, that gets pushed up to like one fatality per a billion miles driven. So for the industry to actually achieve those levels, it's not around the block, it's not next year. This is still a multi-year to multi-decade kind of ambition to get a human level of performance. So kind of playing this back now to uh, Amara's Law and talking about the hype cycle. So the hype cycle of emerging technologies, this is a, a, a kind of graph or kind of depiction created by Gartner, one of the world's leading research and, and advisory companies. And they basically identify five phases that every emerging technology will experience in its life cycle, going from the innovation trigger to the peak of inflated expectations, then down to the trough of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, and then the plateau of productivity. Now, if you overlay the history of automated driving technology, we see that the innovation trigger occurred in the years leading up to 2017. Most of this was sparked by DARPA, otherwise known as the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So this is a R&D arm of the US government that typically supports kind of military applications, but they launched a series of the DARPA Urban Challenge or Grand Challenge, as you may have heard of. I personally participated in one of the early 2007 challenges. Now, 2017 was the peak of the hype, as evidenced by proclamations from companies working in the space and media coverage that made strong and bold statements about driverless cars going to be prevalent and on the road by 2020. Um, in 2018, we began to en enter, I think, into the trough of disillusionment as more companies began to realize really the difficulty and challenges ahead and really fully removing the human from the vehicle and what it means to have a full autonomy system. It was this level setting of expectations, but something that our CEO, Gil Pratt, and I have been saying for many years as we think about the problem domain and, and what it really takes to go from demonstration to product in this uh, space. In 2019, re reality continued to set in. I mean, now it's hard to know in 2020, um, have we reached the bottom of the trough? But indications are that we might be starting to slope back up into the recent announcements about expanded deployments of public testing uh, from others in the industry. Uh, it still may be, though, years or even decades before we reach the plateau of productivity. Now, why? Well, there's the myriad of kind of adoption challenges ranging from economic and employment, ethical, legal, security, energy, and the environment, but also just the huge number of still technical challenges that really remain in, in fielding these kind of capabilities. So ranging from human factors and kind of the social ballet of driving when we make eye contact and um, you know, interact in that way, the you know, road services get paved overnight and changed, so which leads to how do we maintain maps, you know, all weather driving and better sensors, but really also people interacting with people. And so you know, when you think about, say, a green traffic light, when does it not mean go? You know, the moment a cop does this, the entire context of that green light changes. Those are some really hard AI problems uh, that the industry still is yet not, uh, uh, is, is still working to solve. So let me tell you now a little bit about TRI's approach to automated driving. So at TRI, our focus is on creating one system that can operate in two distinct modes, uh, what we call guardian mode and chauffeur mode. In chauffeur, chauffeur is the kind of self-driving technology we hear about most in the press and the industry. So specifically, it's an approach that replaces the human driver with a machine. Chauffeur essentially removes the human from the driving equation, either completely or in all environments. And it's typically, we talk about L4 systems, which means it's meant to operate within a restricted operational design domain. This is a wonderful goal, and someday we may achieve it. But it's essential to not underestimate how hard a task chauffeur systems are, both technologically and soci sociologically. And I'll talk about more about that in a few minutes. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, what we think about is leveraging that same core technology and underlying software system in the automation to develop what we call guardian mode, which is meant to amplify human control of the vehicle, not replace it. We think of this as the ultimate version of Toyota Safety Sense. With Toyota Guardian, the driver is meant to be in control of the car at all times, except in those cases when the Toyota Guardian anticipates or identifies a pending incident, 
and employs a corrective response in coordination with the driver's input. The eventual goal here is to create a car that's incapable of causing a crash. It sounds simple, but it, this is a, to do this in general purpose, this is a really tough challenge to think about don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. How do we use a full 360 degree around you kind of AI system to work in combination with the human to achieve that goal? Now, importantly, our view of the guardian chauffeur uh, applications is through the lens of convergence, the convergence of active safety with automated driving. We're really developing one unified technology stack to address both the guardian chauffeur applications. So majority of the code between the two applications when it comes to perception, prediction, planning, it's all shared. And this is the kind of lens of convergence of how we think about our strategy in automated driving with active safety. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about our chauffeur uh, applications. So we're working on two vehicles that integrate L4 automated driving. The first is TRI's automated driving test vehicle, the P4. This is our latest generation of vehicle, both testing here in the US as well as in Japan. We're exploring L4 in a Mazda application to be demonstrated next year in Tokyo. The second is Toyota's LQ concept vehicle, which leverages advanced technology to build an emotional bond between the car and driver. And it features TRI's automated driving technology stack. Our testing in Japan is conducted in the Odaiba district, a busy and often congested waterfront subcenter. Odaiba's complex uh, environment of, includes both pedestrians and vehicle traffic, diverse road infrastructure, and tall glass buildings, which provides a challenging setting in which to research and develop the capabilities of Toyota's automated driving technology. Now, on the Toyota Guardian side, we're re reusing that same technology, but let me tell you how it's applied a little bit differently. So Toyota is actually doubling down on human driving. Guardian is designed to correct for human mistakes and human weaknesses, and assisting the most vulnerable people at both ends of the age spectrum where far too many lives are lost. We think that the Guardian approach presents a more immediate opportunity to deploy automated vehicle technology at scale in an active safety application that's meant to save as many lives as possible as soon as possible. We believe that in the future, Toyota Guardian will not only save lives, but make driving even more joyful than ever. Regardless of your driving skill, the Guardian system can enhance your driving performance while keeping you safe. And in fact, we believe so strongly in Guardian that Toyota has announced Guardian for All and is planning to offer to the industry so that the benefits can extend beyond Toyota and Lexus vehicles. So let me tell you what Guardian is and how we kind of think about it. And actually, um, the analogy I like to give is thinking about a modern fighter jet. When a pilot flies the stick, they're actually not flying the plane directly. They're, they're working with a low-level flight control system that keeps them within this uh, aerodynamic kind of envelope of control. We're essentially trying to do the same thing, but on the ground with a vehicle. And it's actually a much comp more complex uh, engineering and technical challenge because now it's our vehicle interacting with the road environment. It's interacting with other users. Um, it's interacting you know, with other drivers and pedestrians. So how do we use this same framework, but meld it with our perception, prediction, and planning, which is really critical to pulling this off and making it work in the real world. Um, some of our unique uh, capabilities we have towards testing this strategy, so what you're he seeing here is one of our dual steering test vehicles. This might look a little bit science fiction to you, because it is. Uh, you're, this vehicle has um, two steering wheels in it. The reason being, on one wheel, we can put a professional safety driver behind it. Um, and they're there while we're working on developing the software, and they're there as basically a backup. But on the other wheel, we can put a regular everyday driver, and we can conduct um, really meaningful user, human machine interaction kind of user studies. So with that second set of wheels, brakes, and pedals, they're all by wire systems, which means that we in software can actually now change the coupling between the steering wheel and the front tire angles uh, of the vehicle. So what you're seeing here now is the depiction of this envelope control in action. So this is from some of our closed course testing. The green carpet basically represents what the vehicle is perceiving live to detect the road, the fusion of that with objects in the scene to say this is the safe region. The human has full agency while they're driving within that green carpet. But as they approach the boundary, the system begins to blend their input with the AI from our stack to keep the car safe and in a controllable regime. Now, how this uh, works in practice when it comes to safety applications, here's another uh, example I'd like to show where now using that exact same framework, we're looking at this, uh, what we call a pop-out scenario here. You can imagine this is like a blind driveway kind of event. Somebody's coming out into the roadway. Our vehicle is perceiving in real time and understanding the 
other vehicle, it's, it's pending kind of collision with ours. We can't break in time to stop. We have to do a large kind of aggressive lateral mover to avoid it. And so here is where we are actually using this envelope control and our steer by wire framework to actually change that coupling between the steering wheel that the driver is holding onto and what the front tires are doing to make that, um, to keep the vehicle safe. Um, there's a lot of work that we're doing on the human machine interface side of this to make this system knowable and trustworthy and how it works with a human to blend and assist and really provide this corrective input. Now, the other lens through which to view this guardian strategy is through data. When I say the convergence of ADAS and AD, so automated driving with the active safety, um, it's because we want to exploit the fleet muscle of Toyota at our 10 million cars per year scale that we produce. By getting the core of our perception and prediction planning framework into this active safety paradigm of Guardian, it allows us to collect meaningful real world data. Humans can drive today where autonomy cannot. We can be getting data under harsh weather conditions. We can get data in congested urban scenarios. Uh, we can get data that tells us, you know, when is a human making a different decision that we didn't think was really plausible? It allows us to learn from humans. So let me now tell you about some of the kind of core AD capabilities that are shared between Guardian and Chauffeur as we execute on this strategy. Importantly, to realize this Guardian First strategy, there's some fundamental assumptions that a lot of the industry takes that we need to begin to relax to execute on this Guardian First strategy. So for example, um, a lot of efforts will assume dense 360 LiDAR. They're gonna assume that HD maps exist everywhere. Um, to realize this kind of Guardian First strategy in the personal vehicle space, we need need to begin to engineer a more robust system that can begin to relax some of these constraints. So we think about a dialable system in terms of our perception and compute, one that can scale to a level four MOS scenario, but can also can scale to say a Lexus or a Toyota personally owned vehicle in terms of thinking about maybe LiDAR is there, maybe it's not. Uh, maybe maps are there, maybe they're not, right? We also really think about the human machine interaction and amplification side of this. So all that work that I was just talking about with steer by wire and how's it the uh, knowable, trustworthy system to really blend and assist the human. We think about the prediction planning under uncertainty in these frameworks. We want it to work everywhere at some base level, but then improve through time and its performance um, as the system learns more and more uh, through experience. And that also ties into our fleet learning, where we're working on large scale kind of machine learning methods that go beyond today's uh, supervised labeling approaches to really paradigms that can scale with raw data. So toward this, on the, on the mapping side of things, uh, we think about large scale kind of mapping frameworks. So here you're seeing a depiction of our globally scalable mapping framework that on the back end, it can easily consume both LiDAR derived data, camera derived data, but it can produce the exact same kind of representation and allow us to kind of think about how do we leverage Toyota scale to kind of roll out and grow HD maps at scale, leveraging the POV fleet. Toward this end, TRI has actually done a lot of work on how do we uh, make this scalable framework work without LiDAR and think about uh, how we can exploit more vision first. So what you're seeing here in this video on the left is a HD uh, kind of feature-based map like you would find in the rest of the industry, but this is actually derived uh, purely from vision, equivalent to what you might find from say like a Toyota Safety Sense equipped sort of vehicle. And on the right, what you're seeing is now a, vi a video of our vehicle localized in the map, again, using vision only. In this case, we've overlaid a LiDAR 3D point cloud just for context and visualization for you, so you can see the accuracy of that. Next, uh, TRI has put a lot of efforts uh, into our machine learning pipeline that we use for both for perception and also beginning to apply in the planning prediction space. So Ouroboros is, is our internal name for the basically our unified ML platform to curate, train, and deliver all of the following kind of ML models that we're using today in driving. So from 2D vision detection to kind of uh, LiDAR bird's eye view, traffic light estimation, semantic segmentation, uh, park car estimation, and also importantly, monocular depth estimation from vision. Now, here's one of the recent results uh, from our ML uh, research team that we presented at one of the top computer vision conferences last year. This is some of our work in Sim to Real. So what we're trying to do here is, you know, if we think about taking LiDAR from, away from the system, trying to be more vision first in what we're trying to do, um, how do we reconstruct the 3D world around us purely just from a monocular vision? So what you're seeing here in the Sim to Real, uh, we've actually trained a machine learning model that knows how to take, say, the general kind of shape of what a typical sedan might look like, but then how do we scale it? 
how do we kind of uh, estimate its 3D pose and configuration space so that we minimize basically that model's, that 3D geometry of that model, its reprojection error back into the image. And what you can see we can produce from that then is actually a very accurate kind of 3D model of understanding from vision only, you know, where the other vehicles are, where they are in space relative to us. And so in the video you're seeing play here, um, uh, you're seeing the 3D kind of bounding boxes reprojected back into 3D space. And then the bottom half of the video, uh, we're overlaying that on top of a uh, high density 3D LiDAR point cloud just for reference. So you can see the visual, the quality and the accuracy with which from vision alone, we can reproduce uh, 3D geometry. Uh, and then finally, you know, all this kind of comes together in our prediction and planning framework. So we're working on a risk-aware decision-making where we think about this multi-hypothesis scene prediction, not only for the other agents and understanding what our potential vehicle ego interaction is uh, with the other uh, vehicles. And so this allows us to model complex inter interaction between agents. So what you're seeing here is some depictions from, say, learned classifiers that allow us to detect and understand parked cars to dense traffic maneuvering, then also interacting with pedestrians, say, at crosswalks. So in conclusion, uh, the point I want to drive home today and emphasize that humans can drive today where autonomy cannot. How do we turn that into an advantage? And we do that by developing a unified technology of stack to address both guardian and chauffeur. We view it through the lens of convergence of an advanced active safety system, something that goes far beyond what we see in the industry today in terms of, say, just automatic emergency braking. We're thinking about steering, braking, acceleration as the full gamut of how autonomy might work with the human to don't leave the road, don't hit things, don't get hit. At the same time, it shares the same core technology with our auto L4 automated driving capabilities. And so for all these reasons, uh, TRI, we believe that the Guardian approach may enable deployment of automated vehicle technology much sooner by using it in this active safety paradigm to save as many lives as possible from traffic crashes. The reason for this is that Guardian can operate on a spectrum and develop capability over time. Unlike the chauffeur application, which essentially needs to be near perfect to operate at very high levels of confidence 100% of the time. So in Guardian, uh, we can basically dial the system to deploy only when it has a uh, very confident and really an understanding the situation, the scene, and predicting the likelihood of a crash. And again, not to replace the human, but to assist the human, make you superhuman as a driver. Our recent developments on our L4 or Moz chauffeur application provide a, you know, forward progress with Guardian due to the unified technology stack that we have, which you know, shares in common much of the perception prediction planning frameworks. Um, so this really, by working on chauffeur, it actually bolsters our deployment of this Guardian first strategy. And you'll see that demonstrated on a global stage next year. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and share with you Toyota's Guardian first strategy. Thanks.